Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today I am so excited to finally get to put out my review of Boosh, The Justice of Kings by Richard Swan. And this is the first book in the Empire of the Wolf. I think it's a trilogy, maybe it's a series. Uh, yeah, I think it's a trilogy. And this was extraordinarily kindly uh, sent to me by uh, Orbit. This is an advanced reader copy uh, in exchange for an honest review. And I have no problem giving an honest review for this because this book was absolutely fantastic. I heard about this book first from my wonderful friend Abby at Abby Salter. Uh, she was sent one of these, these special art copies that are like, you know, numbered like one of a hundred and signed uh, right there in the front. Eh, hold on, I gotta find it. Um, yeah, so this is like number 27. And I saw, like, no one is above the law. Like, the, 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 the title of the book isn't even on the cover. It's just the catchphrase, no man is above the law. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, coming February uh, 2022. And then I read the, and then I read the description. And just, just listen to this description. Sir Conrad Von Vault is a justice, a judge, jury, and executioner all in one. He has sworn to travel the empire and uphold the law by way of his sharp intellect, arcane powers, and skill as a swordsman. Yet these are dangerous times even for a justice. And for those who've been watching my channel for a while, who know my love of the Great Coat series by Sebastian de Castell, traveling magistrates, this idea of a judge who travels around and sets up courts in, in these towns across, the, across an empire or a kingdom and settles disputes of the townspeople who, you know, can't really get uh, justice elsewhere just really, really appeals to me. And so I wrote Orbit and said, can I please, can I please get an arc of this freaking book? And they sent one to me. And I, I read it and it was absolutely fantastic. I loved it this book. So, uh, you should, the short answer is you should go ahead and you should freaking uh, pre-order this. Get ready for February. So without wasting any more time, let's get down to business. Let me go ahead and talk about the things that I love about this book and maybe a couple things that some people might not love the most, but this is a great book. So, The Justice of Kings. And so, this tells the story, as you heard in the back, of a traveling magistrate named Sir Conrad von Vault in the Sovan Empire. He works for the emperor. There are other magistrates around. We do meet an, uh, another magistrate at, during the course of the story. And from the conceit, I did not realize that this was going to be first person and first person told not by Conrad von Vault, but instead by his clerk. His 19-year-old uh, female clerk named Helena, who used to be a, a feral orphan on the streets of this one city after this major war that happened that Von Bolt had fought in. And he took her in and is teaching her how to be a magistrate. And so the premise of this story is Helena is telling, or Helena, I don't know how it's pronounced, is telling us this story from far in the future, from decades in the future. She's an old woman and she is piecing together these accounts through what she had written down as his clerk. She writes down like all the interviews and all the judgments he has. And it's like, it's kind of like her diary. So this is a combination of both Croker and the, the analysts from the Black Company series, but also a similar conceit to Bernard Cornwell's The Warlord Trilogy, which is just fantastic. You know my love of the Warlord Trilogy, where Dervil, who was a, a, a warrior who was really close to Arthur, is in his old age, he is writing. He is writing an account of Arthur as he knew him, trying to separate the legend from the, the history. So we see Arthur through Dervil's eyes, as an old man, we see, you know, Dervil when he was young, uh, hanging out with Arthur. Same thing here, we see Von Vault through Helena's eyes. And first, right off the bat, I'm gonna go ahead and say that Swan does a remarkable job with Helena. He is a male author, but writes a really convincing 19-year-old female protagonist. She acts very much like a lot of the teenagers that I teach, or, you know, they're freshmen in college before you transition, you know, you transition from kid who's in high school to young adult 
in college and there's this kind of like transitory period where they don't really know kind of who they are and that's very much what Helena feels like. Her voice is very fresh. She doesn't actually love hanging out with Von Vault all that much. She thinks his job is boring. Like, all the laws and stuff. She isn't sure she really even wants to be a magistrate. Yeah, her life is way better than it was stealing crap on the streets. But <laughs> she thinks magistracy is boring. And Von Vault will never take her to see the cool stuff, like the duels or any or the hangings, any of the, like, you know, the bloody, gory, exciting stuff. He doesn't ever want her to go go see that, so she's just like, why is this, what is this stupid job? Like, you know, ugh. But, that being said, she also, even though she finds this company boring, she also adores Von Volt and seeks his approval. And the things that she does, she wants Von Volt to, to give her an girl uh, or a good job or a pat on the back. So she's constantly seeking approval from Von Volt and... As the story progresses, we see that she is very much, she very much holds on to Von Vault as kind of her stability. Having grown up during this, this devastating wartime in this war-torn country, Swan does a really good job of showing the, the some of the classic signs of PTSD. She seems kind of well-adjusted until, you know, if Von Vault starts being, acting any kind of erratic or doesn't have that, that standard authority presence or this, this stability that she looks to him for, then she starts to feel really anxious and adrift and doesn't feel safe and starts showing those signs of, of feeling in danger, those, those PTSD signs. He does a really good job with Helena. I love her, love her as a main character. And I, was, I wasn't sure what I was going to to start with because I thought that this was going to be very much like Great Coats, where Falchio is, you know, the story's from Falchio's perspective. I thought it was going to be from Von Vault's perspective, and it is not. But I could not imagine the story told a different way. Now, I, I was hooked on this book from the very first chapter. The chapters have names, which I really like name chapters. That's old school. People don't do that a lot anymore. And each chapter has kind of an epigraph, which is from uh, a saying from uh, one of the lawmakers or one of the philosophers or one of the other uh, magistrates. Or it has some law written down, something that's related to the chapter at hand, which is nothing new, but I, I, I really enjoyed those. And from the beginning, Swan tells us kind of everything we need to know about the situation, about the characters, about the world. The world, the Sovan Empire, went through this huge war uh, of, of expansion where it conquered kind of these uh, frontier cities or provinces. It felt, the whole thing felt very kind of, I don't know, like Germanic or Eastern European to me. The world itself actually felt to me a lot like um, Andrzej Sapkowski's uh, Witcher books as far as kind of the names for, for towns and, and things and just the general kind of atmosphere felt very like that. But just as kind of like this, this sparse, kind of desolate, uh, outpost frontier kind of, kind of settlements that we come to that are far, far enough removed from the main capital of the, of the, of the empire that the magistrates, the magistrates have to be sent out there in order for the townspeople to get any justice. We immediately see Von Volt's job of setting up these courts and trying these, uh, these cases. And I love the conceit of knowing, kind of having foreshadowing of what's going to come, what's going to come later. At the very, the very first sentence of the book is Helena saying that this small town is where everything started to go wrong. This, they're in this small town, Helena and Von Vault, and then his kind of like bodyguard, his man-at-arms, if you will, named Bresinger, who is, I like him. He just likes to sing a lot. He's from a different, he's a different countryman than, than Von Vault or Helena. And he just likes to sing as a hunter. He's just this big kind of dude who protects, who protects uh, Von Vault. And it shows us right off the bat how the Empire rules, which is extremely harshly. The Empire is harsh, but we also see that it's not, it's not evil. It doesn't flaunt its power unnecessarily. It is harsh, but it is also fair. So we get the idea right, up, right away that the, the, the law, at least, the law of the Empire is a just law. Because even though, even though the laws are harsh, they are not, I mean, they are meant as deterrents, but they are not cruel. They, there, there are clear laws and there are clear consequences. 
and and so that's cool to see right up front. We also see we also see Von Vault use one of the magistrate's powers, and in this he uses in this very first chapter he uses what's called the Emperor's voice, and the voice it has the power to compel obedience. Uh, it's just like this booming voice. It's always written in italics. Boom! Tell me what you know. And the person that the voice is used on has to, has to, bleh, unless they're like trained to resist these powers, are compelled to tell the magistrate what, what they know. And this is really cool. And it seems like it's overpowered, but it's not. Swan does a really excellent job setting up the limitations on these abilities. And it's made clear that not every magistrate has the same power. There are a bunch of different powers that each magistrate during their training kind of is, is gifted with or is born with, something to that effect. We're not entirely sure. But each magistrate only has like one or maybe two, if they're very powerful, of the magistrate power. So Von Vault has two of these abilities, and the other magistrate that we meet um, at a different time has a completely separate ability. And they are limited. They cannot, uh, using the voice exhausts uh, Von Vault, he can only really use it once at a clip because it just takes so much energy to, to override someone's free will. And he also doesn't like using it unless he has exhausted all other possibilities. But the law of the land is that magistrates are to be obeyed. Anytime they are there, they have ultimate authority and they speak with the emperor, they speak with the, the emperor's voice, both literal and figurative, figurative. And so the law is that you are supposed to tell the magistrate everything you know. So if they're not telling you, then that must, I mean, they're in violation of law anyway, then are you authorized? Some good questions about justice and the law in this particular book. But even though Von Vault is, is, is set up as this, this embodiment of, of justice and the law, we do see in this same first chapter his clemency and his mercy. He doesn't want to enact the harshest punishment on these, these villagers who are, you know, practicing paganism rather than the, the state religion. He doesn't want to execute them, unlike this, this priest that is hanging, that, you know, attached himself to their, their attache. And so he's like, they're freaking, they're frontier people. Like, he's like, guys, this is very dangerous. You guys need to take, you cover this up better if this is what y'all are going to do. So he gives them a harsh warning, mostly warning them about that, that other people who saw this might not be quite as, as merciful. So we see that side of Von Volt's character as well, right from the first chapter. And I love Helena, and I love Bresinger, and there's several other characters I really like. But I also really like that there's a mystery at the heart of this. Uh, there is a murder in a town that uh, they end up in, and he tries to solve it and gets embroiled in something larger. And Von Vault himself is just a fascinating character. Absolutely fascinating. He is, he is kind of like the gunslinger. Um, he is one of these stubborn men who, who grew up in a different time when things were different and is kind of trapped in this thinking of the way, the, uh, thinking of how the way things were, which is the way that he thinks things should be. And so we watch Von Vault struggle with adapting in this new climate, in this in this kind of, in, in the political climate of the empire currently, the church, the state religion, and its Templars are growing in power and influence, and kind of the frontier nobles, like the frontier dukes, are, we see them raising kind of provincial militia and are, you know, not obeying the laws that the emperor has set down. And so as the story goes on, we see that the, em the emperor and the empire's hold on these provinces and on, on the religion and on the military might not be quite as strong as we first think. And the glue that holds all of this together, according to Von Vault, is what he calls the primacy of the common law. He says this all the time. The primacy of the common law is that it is the law that makes us civilized. The great equalizer among everyone, both peasant and noble, is that common law. Everyone is subject to the emperor's law. And this, 
Y'all know that this hits me right here because this is a Commander Vimes thing. There must be policemen for kings. Law, the law must apply equally to everyone at the top and the bottom or it's not justice, it's tyranny. And that idea is here as well. And that's what Von Vault, Von Vault is in many ways, the ideal magistrate. The, uh, he serves the law and justice, and there is no higher authority than that. And so he doesn't care. He doesn't care if it's baron or duke or peasant or mayor. If you break the law, Von Vault is going to bring you to justice. And we see, and he's grumpy a lot. Like, be prepared. Like, Von Vault is grumpy a lot. And part of this is because he doesn't understand why his efforts to do the right thing, because even when he loses his cool, he still tries to do the right thing, are con constantly frustrated with people not, like, not respecting his authority or respecting the law. And he just has a rough time accepting this kind of breakdown of that primacy of the common law. The primacy of the common law is what protects the magistrates. It's why the magistrates can travel solo and are and can go to all of these towns and people just submit to their authority because that is what you're supposed to do. And these are the great questions that Swan asks in this book. The fragility of authority, which is the fact that much authority is implicit in society. The authority that you have really relies on the people you have authority over accepting that. It's governing with the consent of the governed because this it reminds me a lot of the the roman tribunes the roman tribunes were sacrosanct the tribune was it was an, an elected official given it could only be plebeians it was given to give the plebeians more rights they had the power of the veto which was an incredible power the second the patricians granted the plebs the office of tribune they immediately tried to get rid of it and for for 400 years the Tribune just stymied the work of the patricians. I mean, at some point they realized that, you know, if you can't kill them, you just bribe them, you just buy them, you know, everyone's for sale. But the Tribunes, it was sacrosanct, meaning they were protected by the gods. If you did them any harm, it was execution. And that protected them until it didn't. Until the Senate one, one time needed to stop land reform, and though they, so they assassinated the Tribune. And nothing happened to them. And when nothing happened, it's like, oh, so we can kill them. And that really began a century of violence in ancient Rome, this last century of the Republic, is that authority was there until it wasn't. We see this breakdown in decorum all the time. There are th just look at politics. Actually, don't. Don't ever look at politics. It's poison. But just look at the things that happen now that couldn't have happened 30 years ago because it just wasn't done. And then people said, well, why not? I'm going to do it. And then they do things and nothing happens. So, well, now that's the new normal. This thing is sacred until it isn't. I think of myself as a teacher. What would I do? If every one of my students just decided one day that they just weren't going to do my work, they were going to get up and they were all going to leave. They were just all going to leave and they were going to go. How could I stop them? Physically? No, I can't. I have authority in my classroom. I have only the authority my students permit me to have. And that is terrifying <laughs> uh, sometimes. So I love this question uh, about the, the, the fragility of authority. Like, what, what is this concept of the authority and justice and this, this abstract concept of the law? I love it so much. And so that phrase, no man is above the law, means something different when we set out than it does by the end of the book. And it is just... Fascinating. I love all of these, these things that he explores, like moral absolutism versus moral relativism. Always an interesting discussion. Can you have justice and vengeance simultaneously? The second half of this book just flies. There is one of the most terrifying depictions of necromancy that I've ever seen in fantasy. Just really, really good. I love the mystery, I love the characters, I love the political intrigue. 
It is so good. It has so many things that I love in books. I cannot wait for this second book. I love seeing the growth in all of the characters from the beginning uh, to the end. Helena, Von Vault, Brazinger, and the other characters, they are not the same at the end of the book when we meet them, and that is always fantastic to see. I cannot recommend this book enough. If any of that sounds like something that you're interested in, for the love of humanity, please pick it up. Guys, on the King Finn approval system, I give this book uh, a superb to superb plus. You know, maybe it is a superb plus, uh, but I want to give it somewhere to go. It's definitely superb, maybe even superb plus. I'm hoping by the end of this series I can change the whole thing to superb plus, maybe even a superb plus plus. That is how much I loved this book. Out of five stars, I absolutely give it five stars. Like, ah, uh, so good. So good, guys. Go freaking pre-order this book. It is out in February. I think it's February 22nd of 2022. Go follow Richard Swan on Twitter, pre-order this book, and then come and talk to me about this. The only person I have to talk to it about, about it right now is Patrick, who also loved it. You can go check out Patrick's review on Goodreads as well. I'll try to link it uh, down below. So guys, that is it for me for today. As always, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description, and I'll see you next time, guys. Mm -hmm.